Hi, uh, lovely to see you. Look, come on into the study. There's something I really want to show you this evening. It's another little treasure that one uncovers. So we'll go back to the shelf where I've got, you know, books that have either some special value to me because of personal association or because of antiquity, uh, or both. Uh, and um, this is the one. I've got some little volumes here. They've all got stories to tell. But this is just... Uh, there's so much to say about this is a tiny little volume, I mean a real pocket edition gathering of the the famous uh, magazine, The Spectator, which was really the first sort of literary magazine. And, and it's an odd volume, it's, it's volume the sixth. You can see there it's uh, 1747. Uh, it's got some lovely little bits of engraving. And uh, this is it. I, you, I picked this up in David's bookshop in Cambridge. It was just sitting there. and They'd got a lot of quite antiquarian books, some at considerable prices. But this said, odd volume, four pounds. Well, of course, you know, if you were... Do have a, come and have a seat. If you were buying... If you were buying a a three-decker novel, you know, and there's only one volume of it there, you'd be annoyed because you maybe miss out the plot. But the whole point about The Spectator was that it was it was published daily just for two years, 17, um, uh, 11 and 12, I think. And um, the two great writers in it were Addison and Steele, you know, literary giants. And uh, uh, each issue had a... Uh, was about two and a half thousand words. And eventually it was all gathered together in, in seven volumes. But it really doesn't matter if you've only got volume six, you know, because you can dip into it anywhere. And, um, you know, it's an occasional set of pieces. And they had, they set themselves... I mean, they really invented the well-written magazine or journal, the thing that was a little bit more reflective and not just the news. And uh, in the, one of the early issues... Um, uh, Steele, I think it was, uh, rather than Addison, set out their aim, and it was really beautiful. They said um, uh, they wanted to enliven morality with wit and to temper wit with morality. So they wanted, you know, the beauty and intellect and largeness of the mind, but they weren't just being, you know, cynical journalistic hacks. They were really trying to, to inculcate a better way of living. Anyway, I bought this, I was very really pleased with it, it needs a bit of rebinding, but I, I bought it and I carried it off to the pub, you know, and sat down to examine my treasure. And, um, you know, I bought a pint, and the pint was £4.20. And it, I, I was astonished, come on George, I was astonished to think that this little book in my hand had cost me less than a pint. Well, you know, 17... I mean, this was a book bound and beautifully printed and in somebody's hand, you know, a couple of decades before the United States became a country. Um, uh, you know, what else from the mid-18th century can you buy that's still in working condition and that you can enjoy for less than the price of a pint? Anyway, I, I was very satisfied with, with the price of it and grateful, grateful to have such a thing in my hand. But then... It still has the little, the little uh, beautiful silk bands that would have been, and I just opened it, it sitting there in the pub, at the uh, the place where the where the where the little bookmark was, thinking, well, I wonder what the last thing that somebody, you know, read. Here's this book that's been 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 here for so long, and I began to peruse it. It was from Saturday, August the ninth. This would have been in seventeen. 12, although these were gathered in the 1740s. And I read the following words. Um, there is no more pleasing exercise of the mind than gratitude. It is accompanied with such an inward satisfaction that the duty is sufficiently rewarded by the performance. It's not like the practice of many other virtues, difficult and painful, but attended, but attended with so much pleasure that were there no positive command which enjoined it, or any recompense laid up hereafter, a generous mind would indulge it for the natural gratification that accompanies it. If gratitude is, done, is, uh, is due from man to man, how much more from man to his maker? The Supreme Being does not only confer upon us those bounties which proceed more immediately from his hand, but even those benefits which are conveyed to us by others. Every blessing we enjoy, by what means soever it may be delivered to us, is the gift of him who is the great author of good, 
the Father of mercies. Isn't that fantastic? Every blessing in your mouth, what means soever it's delivered. I read that and I thought, gosh, well, that includes the blessing of this pint, you know, delivered by the drayman and eventually the barman, and the blessing of this little book, you know. Um, all the thought that Addison put into the essay and the print, you know, the printer and even the books are just wonderful. So I carried on turning the pages and then I realised with a kind of shock of grateful recognition that in fact these prose considerations of what gratitude is were, in, were Addison's preamble to a poem. And when I looked at the poem I realised again with a kind of gentle recognition that this is a poem which has been taken up into the English hymnal, into the whole English hymn tradition, and in fact is one of my favourite poems and one of my wife Maggie's favourite poems, and indeed is the uh, favourite hymns, and is the hymn that we chose at the beginning of our wedding, which took place, in fact, on a, uh, on a Sunday, because Maggie was the deaconess there, and she came into this hymn. So let me just read you. You'll know this. I mean, I'm sure, uh, you know, you have this hymn too. Uh, the poem, although the poem has more verses than the hymn. So I'm reading and suddenly I read these familiar and beautiful words. When all thy mercies, O my God, my rising soul surveys, transported with the view I'm lost in wonder, love and praise. And uh, I was literally, I stood at the altar and turned around and watched Maggie walking in to the church as I sang, transported with the view, I'm lost in wonder, love and praise. So that was glorious. And I had remembered from this hymn that one of these, one of the uh, my favourite verses, um, there's a couple of verses about how God's loving you and caring for you and looking after you before you really know who he is or have any idea about it. So there were a couple of verses which I'd always enjoyed singing unnumbered comfort to my soul thy tender care bestowed before my infant heart conceived from whence those blessings flowed and then a great one for those of us that had uh, slippery paths of youth when in the slippery paths of youth with heedless steps i ran thine arm unseen conveyed me safe and led me up to man so but as i read this as a whole poem i realized that there were other verses that hadn't, as it were, made the cut for the hymn books, but actually uh, I think are really powerful and perhaps have something pertinent to say today. So before that thing about the infancy or the slippery paths of youth, the third verse of it as a poem is really interesting, this, thinking about the life of the unborn. Thy providence my life sustained and all my wants redressed when in the silent womb I lay and hung upon the breast. And it's just wonderful, the man looking back and thinking about how he was comforted and guided. And uh, of course, you may know it. Um, it, it, it finishes uh, with the idea of, of rising into heaven and, um, uh, you know, through every period of my life, thy goodness I'll pursue. And after death in distant worlds, the glorious theme renew. And when you come to that verse, you realise there's a beautiful play on the very opening line. When all thy mercies, O oh my God, my rising soul surveys, transported with the view I'm lost in wonder, love and praise. That refers, of course, to waking up in the morning and rising and seeing the mercies, you know, of God new every morning. But of course, when you read that and after death in distant worlds, you realise that I'm one day my rising soul, my soul rising to heaven, will survey the complete body of his mercies. And of course, it finishes in the end. Uh, Through all eternity to thee, a joyful song I'll raise. For, oh, eternity's too short to utter all thy praise. So you can imagine how I felt sitting in the Eagle pub and Bennett Street in Cambridge with my pint and my little book, feeling exactly the very thing that Addison wanted me to feel, which was gratitude. Thanks for dropping round. <laughs>